Welcome to the Beyond the Mat Podcast, an in-depth talk show discussing exclusively WWE topics. My name's Rick Boogs, and I came to rock with the Beyond the Mat Podcast that is beyond the M-A-double-T Podcast. Podcast! Podcast! Ah! All right, here we go. It's Beyond the Mat. It's August 17, 2022. We're going to go over the past week in WWE. Before we get into that, remember follow us on Twitter at Beyond Matt WWE and look for us on Patreon.com. Patreon.com slash beyond the m-a-t-t got brad with me tonight how you doing brad hey matt welcome back it's great to be back and uh congrats first of all on getting noticed as a top 100 wrestling podcast uh so that's great hey we're doing good thanks to our listeners out there supporting us you know the number one way you can support us you don't have to donate anything you don't have to Join Patreon. You don't have to do anything. Just listen to the show. Download it. It's the best way to support our show. We appreciate all the listeners out there. Everybody that follows us on Twitter and that sends us um, messages and things like that. What did you think of uh, what was going on this week with WWE, Brad? Oh, man, there's a lot going on, man. I, I feel like, you know, first of all, a lot of the shows have centered around Bailey and her group. You know, I'm sure we'll get into talking about, you know, some of that stuff, but just a lot going on, man. And I'm excited for this Friday upcoming with SmackDown because I think that's going to really elevate things. Um, some good stuff, some some OK stuff, but um, nevertheless, interesting. Yep. I definitely think that they're making progress. Lots of good wrestling matches on it. Sort of the absence of a lot of the comedic things that we saw with Vince's uh, creative mind. And we're getting a lot more focus on the wrestling and character development and a lot more seriousness out of the characters as well. Especially um, guys like Kevin Owens and Riddle and even Drew McIntyre. But we'll go back to SmackDown first here. That show kicked off with the tag title tournament first round match with Raquel Rodriguez and Aliyah taking on Shotzi and Zia Lee. Thought this match was a little bit of a throwaway match, not really too great. Raquel and Aliyah ended up winning it with Raquel Hitting the Tahana Bomb and pinning Shotzi at the end. They advance in the tournament. What's your thoughts overall on this tag tournament for the ladies? Yeah, man. I, I'm, I understand they're doing a Raw side and a SmackDown side of, of the tournament. Interestingly enough, the SmackDown side includes an NXT team, um, which is... Zoe Stark and uh, Nikita Lyons, very randomly thrown together NXT team. But, um, you know, listen, I, I, Rodriguez and Aaliyah obviously advanced to the semifinals of this thing. Um, I'm surprised they didn't just kind of mix it up with the nature of the tag team championships being what it is as a belt that floats from show to show. I think you could have had, you know, maybe not the second round matchup of Bliss and, um, uh, uh, Oscar versus um, the the Bailey team, but listen. Nevertheless, I, I think you know the right team here won, and you have a, a, an interesting matchup this week coming up with the NXT team versus Natalia and uh, Sonya Deville. So we'll see what happens there. Yeah, I kind of think that with the NXT team, we're going to see them. You know, they they haven't teamed together before. They're probably going to have some kind of dissension and maybe that would lead to a feud in NXT or something between the two of those ladies. That's sort of what I was thinking uh, is the only sort of creative direction they can go in there. There's no reason why an NXT team should come up and upset a main roster team, especially veteran like Natalia 
and Sonya Deville, but who knows? Maybe they'll advance. Who knows? You know, I, what I think is actually going to happen is you're going to have the premier NXT women's tag team of Toxic Attraction show up and ruin that match for the current NXT tag team, which there was a little feud on Heat Wave. We're not going to talk about NXT, but um, I do think that that is what's going to happen. I think you're going to see your first glimpse of Toxic Attraction on the main roster this Friday. That that would be my guess if I had to guess. Yeah, and I do agree it's a little bit weird that you know, we obviously we had in the first round last week, we had Dakota Kai and EO Sky win their match. And then on Raw this week, we had Bliss and Asuka beat Nikki and Dewdrop, which, by the way, Dewdrop has been lobbying to have her name changed. And it looks like that's going to happen. So I don't think we're going to be calling her Dewdrop for too much longer. But, you know, it is a little bit strange to have them meeting in the second round. You think that they would at least meet, well, I guess the second round then leads to the final round. But because it's Raw versus SmackDown, it makes it so they had to meet in the second round rather than having them on opposite sides of the bracket so they can meet in the finals. So they're clearly not emphasizing one of these two teams. And I would imagine it's Bliss and Asuka who's not really the, the team that they're looking to go forward with as the champions. I think Sky and Kai are going to probably win that match and probably win the whole thing. Now, one of the things I think is interesting is I was at a house show over the weekend and Shayna Baszler and Ronda Rousey were tagging together and they beat the, they just beat the brakes off of uh, Raquel and Aliyah who were, you know, they were so happy to be together. Raquel was carrying Aliyah to the ring and they were hugging each other and, doing circles around the ring together. It was ridiculous. And then they ended up both tapping out at the same time. I wonder if after this tournament, you know, everybody's talking about, well, after this tournament, could um, Boss Glow come back? Could Sasha Banks and Naomi confront the winners of this? I wonder if Baszler and Ronda Rousey could be the first challenger for whoever wins this tournament because that would certainly bring some legitimacy to the women's tags titles, having Ronda Rousey involved in that. Of course, we have Shayna Baszler in the women's title match at Clash of the Castle against Liv Morgan, so I don't know that they would go that way right away. But then again, this isn't going to be wrapped up until around just before Clash of the Castle or just after, so they certainly could tag together. And I don't see Baszler beating Liv Morgan. I think that what what they've done with Liv Morgan, they need to have her win this match against Shayna Baszler to sort of make her title reign somewhat strong. Although, you know, the last couple of weeks, it's kind of fallen apart right in front of the, in front of our eyes. Um, I think we're gonna have potentially um, the the finals of this tournament at Clash of the Castle. I know it's not a big time match, but actually, actually, I do I take can't. that back because that is I impossible because they did announce the three way tag team match. Is that official, Matt? The um, the, the three on three tag team match, Sky, Kai and, and Bailey versus Bianca, Alexa and. and uh, Oscar? Yeah, that's official for Clash of the Castle. So the finals couldn't be at Clash right. of the Castle. It's either going to be the week before and then one of those teams will be the champions at Clash of the Castle. And then they could actually make that match winner take all, you know, have, you know, one of the teams, the tag team champions, one of the teams got Bianca Belair as the women's champion, whichever team wins gets the tag titles and the women's title belt. I don't think they'll do that. Or they'll have to wrap it up, you know, on the Raw or the SmackDown following Clash at the Castle. But either way, that wouldn't, um, that would allow Shayna Baszler and Ronda Rousey to involve themselves in it after Baszler gets done with Liv Morgan at Clash at the Castle. So. The only reason I think that may not happen is because I think the second that tag team championship gets on their waist, 
of Kai and Sky, I think that's when Sasha and Naomi come out um, with with you know Sky and Kai holding the belts high in the ring, and you have a complete showdown and people go ballistic. I, I think that's what will happen um, right after that tournament ends. That, that that would be the only logical way to bring back Sasha and Naomi because I don't think you bring them back alone. You know, I don't think you bring them back one and one. I think you bring them back together. You know. Then what if they confront them and then Rousey and Baszler have something to say about that? And then that causes a number one contenders feud between the two of them, which would then really add some significance to the women's tag team division. Oh, no doubt about it, man. That actually the way to go is to bring out Rousey and Baszler first, because at that point, you know, if you finish it after Clash at the Castle, you have Baszler who is lost, who has nothing else to do. You have Rousey and Baszler who basically both have nothing to do, teaming together. And then as they're confronting uh, Sky and Kai in the ring as the winners of the championship tournament, you then have Sasha and Naomi come out and you make this a big three-way feud leading to the next pay-per-view. Great idea. Yeah, that could be something that we're looking at. So... Again, recently, moving on from that, we'll move on from the uh, women's tag team discussion here at, for a moment and move on to Drew McIntyre. Uh, he had been attacked by Karrion Cross a couple weeks ago. I'm not too big on Karrion Cross. Um, uh, he had a promo on Raw that was really great and Kevin Owens also had a promo that was really great. They ended up having a match that was even better than the promos, and it ended up with the Usos interfering it with the DQ, but that match was outstanding. Um, but how do you feel about the way that they're presenting McIntyre and Kevin Owens, for that matter, at this point? you see any difference, and do you like the direction they're going in? And speaking of tag teams, do you see Kevin Owens possibly teaming up maybe with Sami Zayn at some point if they do a draft or something? Because they're they're talking about doing a draft sometime soon. Maybe Kevin Owens can team up with Sami Zayn. Somebody's got to take those belts off the Usos. So, you well, think? you notice in in when Kevin Owens was walking to the ring to confront McIntyre, he mentioned Sami Zayn, his you know best friend. Sami Zayn was just on the Stone Cold Broken Skull Sessions um, recently mentioning Kevin Owens numerous times as his best friend. I know that Triple H um, is very big on Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens. I'm sure we'd love to get them together. And to me, you know, they're the type of team that legitimately will will, will be there um, as a very legitimate contender to the Usos. So I love the way this all is intertwining with McIntyre and the Usos, even how McIntyre had attacked the Usos on SmackDown after getting attacked himself, only to be re-attacked on Raw with Kevin Owens saying, hey, you know, you, you tell the tribal chief he owes me one to the Usos. Um, this was just a very interesting kind of intertwining dynamic on all these different levels, um, kind of what came out of this segment great promo by drew mcintyre and and owens and and everything including the match i do think it's going in the direction you just mentioned matt with with owens and zane potentially yeah and i think that would be a great thing to see and i think that it's something that you know owens has never been a tag team champion and you know i'm getting a little tired of seeing the usos hold those titles so they need to have they i mean they have no tag division so they need to start putting together some tag teams. Now, speaking of tag teams, we had the Viking Raiders uh, attack, beat the hell out of Kofi Kingston. It was supposed to be Kofi Kingston versus Ivar. Kingston attacked him with a kendo stick when he was making his entrance, and they ended up getting the better of Kingston. Ivar got up on the barricade, did a splash on the Kofi Kingston. Next week, we're supposed to have a new day funeral by the Viking Raiders on SmackDown. I don't know what that's all about, but um, what kind of direction do you think they're going with the Viking Raiders? Man, I, 
it's it's kind of hard to tell at this point, right? Like the only th- people they've really been feuding with have really been the New Day week after week um, since the vicious return. And I don't see them getting back in a title picture against the Usos because we saw that and we saw that get nixed at, I forget what live event it was, Matt, um, where, where they came down the aisle, but it just didn't happen. Crown Jewel. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, it was Backlash, right? Not Crown Jewel, right? No, it was um, Crown Elimination Jewel. Chamber. Yeah, Elimination Chamber. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, I thought it was Crown Jewel because they were both in Saudi. Same place. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so honestly, this is just... I don't know what they're there to do, man. I, I don't know if, if they are really there to just buy time until the draft and the Viking Raiders go to raw, which is kind of where I feel like they would belong a little bit better. I feel like they would fit into raw a little bit better. Um, you know, it's a three hour show. You have a little bit more space to give them some room to operate um, some new rivalries. I mean, there's really no one on SmackDown for them to go against other than the Usos, which isn't happening. So I don't know, man. I, I I just don't see anywhere where it's going necessarily, but the funeral should be interesting. And maybe is that, I mean, are, are, are we potentially getting a big E return in Montreal this week? <laughs> is that possible? I don't think we're going to see that just yet, but I mean, who knows? I do know that one other tag team on SmackDown that just got brought back up is hit row. And, uh, I'm not the biggest fan of them. I understand that they're kind of, it seems like Triple H is adding depth to the roster. Um, You know, a lot of these call-ups aren't just, you know, blowing me away. But somebody like Hit Row, Dexter Loomis, even, I mean, say, I know a lot of people are high on Dakota Kai. I'm really not. Um, I mean, she's fine, but... I don't think she's like any anything spectacular at this point. Um, but what are you? What's your overall feeling about Hit Row? Man, I'm not a big fan, man. Um, and I hate to say it, you know. I, look, I want to like or, or at least have something to appreciate about everyone. I just don't see it here, man. The the whole hip hop act with this B Fab, who I find insufferably annoying. Um, you know, look, if you're out there and you're a fan of hit row, good for you. That's great. I personally am not. And I think that's the beauty of wrestling where you don't have to be a fan of everyone, but I find that act to be a little 1990s death row records played out annoying, stupid. Um, you know, if you want to go, you know, with a hip hop act or something like that, that's fine. But to me, this isn't it. And, uh, I'm just not seeing it, man. And, and and I don't think that they're ready to be put in a feud with the Viking Raiders who are both being shown as almost like squash match teams. You know, I don't think they're ready for either of them to be demoted by losing to the other. So I don't know if that's going there. It might be, but I know we're having the draft so soon, seemingly according to what we're hearing that the draft could be even the week after clash at the castle. So if we're having that draft, I don't see these two teams, Death Row and or Death Row, Hit Row and, and the, the Viking Raiders getting into a feud. I mean, don't they seem very similar to the Street Profits? They do the same thing in the ropes when they enter the ring. Oh, yeah. They, same thing in and out and out. In, out, in, out. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, they do. The, I, I just I'm not a Hit Row guy. I I, I didn't. I, I mean, I understand about people just getting fired out of nowhere and like people being upset about that and you know people being successful in nxt and not really getting much of a chance on the main roster under vince but at the same time i just i don't see what they bring to the table i i do understand kind of that they sort of are kind of that let me up segment they're not that serious they sort of appeal to a younger demographic and you know a demographic that's not me and that's fine you know but at the same time just from a a wrestling standpoint as they fit into a wrestling show i i just don't see it i yeah i I don't see it and we talk about you know look 
I get it. You know, you're right, Matt. Not everyone needs to have the chance to shine just because they were let go as an NXT call up shortly after coming up to the main roster. You know, we forget about people who have been huge successes coming up from the main from NXT to the main roster, whether it's been Austin Theory, whether it's been Matt Riddle, whether it's been even Raquel Rodriguez. You know, I mean, these are recent people, but or relatively recent people. But, you know, not everyone that gets called up is going to be a success and needs time to shine. And to me, um, hit row. Yeah, it's good. It is good to add another tag team. I, I do think that they need another tag team. I just don't like the gimmick with the gang signs and the, this and the, that, and the, where the, you know, I don't know, man, it just doesn't feel special to me or unique to me or, or anything like that. So You know, look, it was funny. Carmelo Hayes was actually at who's, you know, North American champion in NXT. Now he was asked by someone on Twitter. Someone said, hey, you would be a really good fit joining hit row. He replied back. He said, no, thanks. (laughs) So, you know, listen, it's it's um, it's not an act that's for everybody. And I understand where you're coming from with it, man. It doesn't seem necessary. And, And like, I just. Me personally, I don't see every single person get brought back and be like, yes, they brought them back. Yes, they brought, wow, they're giving them a chance that didn't get a chance. Some people didn't get a chance for a reason, you know? Absolutely. And Not everyone's a, a 10 out of 10. Not everyone's going to be Roman Reigns. Not everyone's going to be Baron Corbin, you know? Yeah. Now, at the same time, certain people that got let go got picked up by the other company. And so, you know, again, they're trying to add depth to the roster. Again, it's like, you know, you like baseball, right? And football, you need bench players. Not everybody's a, a four, you know, a 400 hitter or, a, you know, 45 home run. You know, not, not everybody's a starter. You know, you need pinch hitters sometimes. You need a bullpen and things like that. So, like, that's what some of these guys are going to end up being. They're just going to play that role in the roster. But at the same time, I, I the hit whole hit row act, I'm just not into. And, you know, I'm glad to see that there's other fans that are excited about it. But at, for me, I'm not excited about them in particular. I'm more excited just that they're, they're going to come back that that means that other people that maybe I like may come up or come back. Yeah, man. And we will see what happens with these call-ups and with other people coming back and da 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 But I agree, man. Not everyone that was let go, not everyone who was let go was a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Exactly. All right, we're going to take our first break real quick, and we'll be right back. The Beyond the Mad Podcast. We'll be right back. To the Beyond the Mat podcast. But yeah, the other thing about Hit Row, man, is that really the best worker of that group was Swerve, and he's not, he's in the other company now. So, you know, they're kind of bringing this back as more of a novelty act than anything. So, like, you know, we talk about how this. You know, Triple H era, very serious, long wrestling matches, serious characters, not much comedy. And then your sort of comedy acts or your your uh, novelty acts or things like Hit Row. And, you know, that's fine. I'm not that into that act in particular. But, you know, there's other call-ups that we're going to see soon. Most likely Santos Escobar. People like that. I think Santos Escobar would be great on the main roster. Um, but back to Drew McIntyre. At the beginning of the SmackDown, we had Karrion Cross cut a promo um, back there talking about uh, whatever the hell he was talking about. And TikTok and Scarlett's looking at him like she wants to get in his pants. Uh, you know what I mean? Like the whole time he's talking, she's just eyeing him. And then he he turns around the corner and looks at Drew and Drew McIntyre's getting ready to go out to cut his promo. And it's like, you really think Drew McIntyre didn't realize there was a camera crew 
and didn't hear anything that Karrion Cross was saying over there. I I found that to be a little bit comical, but um. Well, yeah, I mean, during McIntyre started doing his promo and he talked about you know Roman's the absent champion, you know, never there, and then the TV screen goes all black and white, and Scarlet comes to the ring by herself, um, no Karrion anywhere to be seen. And that whole um, segment was black and white for a little while, which was kind of a cool look. And Scarlett did look good. And, and, and she, she does have a presence about her um, far more, I think, than Carrie and Cross does in a certain way. And, um, you know, and then the Usos came in and attacked McIntyre. And that's when this whole thing started that spilled over into Raw, you know, on, on Monday. Yeah, to me, Carrie and Cross, you know, he's just... You know, he can cut the promo, he can look scary, he can have the great presentation with the black and white filter, but when the bell rings, he's not that uh, polished in the ring, in my opinion. Um, to me, you know, he's somebody that they brought up to sort of use as somebody that, you know, at house shows they can plug into a main event with somebody who's a top guy or he can get involved and messing up a main event like it seems like he may be trying to get involved in messing up this main event at the clash of the castle but i hope he doesn't mess it up too bad because that's a big main event for the uk and mcintyre and reigns over there um but you know mcintyre to me is uh really starting to kick it up a notch we're not seeing the, the sword he's getting real intense at, on the raw um promo that he cut he said listen we're two wrestlers in a wrestling ring let's just wrestle and that's what they did and they, they really put on a great match and, and i i like the direction they're going with mcintyre he's and um you know I, i'm interested to see where where he goes, you know? Could he beat I mean, Drew? Matt, could he beat uh, Roman Reigns? I mean, that was my question to you. I mean, do you look, man? This is a weird main event because it, it, in the it, at Clash of the Castle, because in the first way, in the first way, you think, well, there's no way that Roman is going to lose with all this momentum and, and, and all the merchandise being sold and the Paul Heyman and the bloodline having all the belts. Um, there's no way that's going to happen. But then you say, well, it's in England. It's, it's near or as close to he's ever going to wrestle to Drew McIntyre's hometown. There's going to be 70,000 people there. It's going to be ballistic. Um, it, it, I, I, <laughs> Man, if this match was for one belt, I could, I would bet anything that Drew wins. You know, at least one of the belts. With the way it is now for every championship, I don't know, man. I, I, I got to be honest with you. I think this is as close to like a 50-50, maybe a 60-40 toss-up towards Reigns than anything I could ever imagine um, or any pay-per-view that we've seen in the last year. Would you agree? I do, and I think the factor of Triple H being there now and the factor of not knowing what the hell Karrion Cross's role is in this, you know, who who knows what's going to happen here. I, I really think it's something that um, could we could see Roman Reigns lose to somebody who isn't an up, you know, everyone wants to see him lose to an up-and-coming star and all that, and then... At the same time, everybody also wants to see him hold that title for another year because he's held it for this long. Why not get to a thousand days or whatever, you know? And maybe Triple H doesn't care about all that. Maybe he wants a, a full-time champion. Maybe there's something that happens over the next couple weeks that turns this match into some sort of situation where it's only for one title maybe we get a theory cash in that changes the match to one title i don't know you know i want to bring up something really interesting um theory was on an interview i forget who it was with maybe it was with denise salcedo 
backstage somewhere, backstage at the WrestleMania 39 um, kickoff show. And Theory said, you know, I might hold on to my belt until that Roman Reigns versus Rock match at WrestleMania 39. And he goes, right after the Rock wins, he goes, I'll cash in on the Rock or something like that, which that that I could see happening. You know, um, I don't think that this is the appropriate time for a theory cash in. And I don't think that that's going to happen. So, man, I I think we're going to learn a lot on this Friday Smackdown. Look, it's in a a big international city in Montreal. You know, they want to do something good for this Smackdown. Um, Roman is going to be on the show. Drew is going to be there. Maybe you get some sort of stipulation with theory coming out where you hear it's only for one belt. I don't know if that's too obvious, but again, man, this is, I I cannot call it. I just don't know if they would make drew lose in front of his home people, you know, man, like I I think that's a factor. I'm sure they're thinking about that. Right. Yeah. Especially lose clean. But then again, do you want to make him have a, a bullshit finish in front of, the UK that hasn't had a big pay-per-view in, in 30 years, you know? So there's a lot, yeah, of, there's a lot of factors in play there. Especially with Karrion Cross being the um, catalyst for that bullshit finish. Like at the end of the day, he's a guy that really most people don't know. Uh, a lot of diehards know who he is, but I don't know if that's the guy you involve. It's not like you're involving Undertaker in the finish. You know, it's not like you're involved, you know, for a crowd of this size and for an event of this magnitude, you know, that that's the thing to me, man. I don't think you could have carrying cross screw this up. I think having carrying cross on the roster screws things up. Yeah. Weird, man. Weird. Yeah. I mean, but Moving on here on SmackDown, we had Liv Morgan and Shayna Baszler do the contract signing. Shayna Baszler attacks Liv Morgan, takes her to the top rope. (laughs) Liv Morgan reverses it into a bulldog, which Shayna Baszler still had to take three steps to get to the table. So it was a little bit of a a goofy-looking spot. The last two SmackDowns, Liv's got some significant chance from the crowd of you tapped out. She's gotten booed a little bit. I feel like the finish at SummerSlam hurt her. I felt like putting her out in front of the audience hurt her a lot. Um, and she didn't handle that. I just feel like they're exposing her a little bit too much. And that's why they need to have her go over here against Shayna Baszler, give her some legitimacy. Cause if she loses to Baszler, that basically makes just defines her down to a perpetual mid Carter. Um, and you know, I'm not a, the biggest Liv Morgan fan. You know, I, I feel like she's won in a heel way twice. She cashed in on somebody who was injured at the end of their match in Ronda Rousey. And then she won the Ronda Rousey match while tapping out. The second time and then you know she's just not they're not booking her like a baby face even though she is and then she did not handle that situation well when the first time she got booed and then in this situation she just she basically the same thing happened so she's struggling here and she needs a boost i'm not sure what's gonna happen where do you see that going with Liv morgan and Shayna baszler Oh, I think Liv Morgan's got to be a heavy favorite to to win this match. And I don't think that there's any way that um, Baszler wins. I think this is a way to get Liv a great win that will maybe solidify her against a very tough person in Baszler. You know, Um, a a way to get her a win that that's really going to elevate her in in the minds of a lot of people against, you know, someone who's who's rough and rugged. Yeah, I I do think that. You know, they need to make her look strong in this match. It cannot be like the Rousey match, five minutes of her just getting her ass kicked and, you know, only being able to get in one move of offense and running away from a submission hold the whole time. You know, they need to book it a way that, you know, Lib at least looks strong one way or the other in, in winning or losing fashion. 
You know what I'd love to see, man? And, and look, I don't know if they would do this to, play, to Baszler, but I'd love to see a very clear, like, wire-to-wire win by Morgan, where there's almost, like, never a point in the match where Baszler really has a clear advantage or is in a position to do any damage really whatsoever. I mean, maybe she has a submission hold and Liv gets out of it or whatever, but I'd like to see something like that. And, you know, I, I know that that's not very nice to do to Baszler, but, um, you know, they're putting her on a pretty big stage here um, in that regard. But I, I, I think that's what's needed for Morgan. And as I'm just scrolling through, just looking at the odds, not that this is a, a major indication of anything, but Liv Morgan is a four to one favorite to win that match right now on bet online. So just something you might want to think about. Yeah, I think Liv Morgan will go over in this match. I don't think it'll be uh, Liv Morgan just tearing the house down against Baszler and, you know, dominating the match because that's just not what we've seen from Triple H in really any of the matches aside from the squash matches. They've all been competitive. They've all been back and forth. They've all been dramatic. We've had near, you know... The winner has been in question in almost every single match that we've seen. So I do think that it'll be a match that's competitive and both women will come out looking because that's, you know, how you should book matches. Both, both people should, no matter who wins, both people should come out looking strong. And I think that Triple H understands that. And I think he'll do that. Now, I don't know what he sees in Liv Morgan. I know that he likes Shayna Baszler a lot, but I I do think that in the long haul, you don't want to bury Liv Morgan any more than she's already, you know, sort of gotten herself buried. Not uh, not necessarily buried, but, you know, you don't want to damage her any more than you already have. She is a, a fan favorite and a prominent part of the women's division at this part at this point. So, you know, if she's going to win this match or lose the match, it's it's got to be competitive. And Baszler's got to look strong in it, too. Otherwise, you know, it just it defines her down even more. And they obviously don't want to continue to do that to her. I don't think that's something Triple H wants to do. But her losing would open up the possibility for her to tag with Ronda Rousey after this match, which is something I think is possible. I do think Ronda Rousey's star power makes it difficult to put her in the tag team division unless it's going to be something that's featured a lot. So if you do have Sasha Banks and Naomi come back and you have, you know, I guess Kai and Sky as the champions, and then Banks and Naomi in the tag team picture, and Baszler and Rousey in the tag team picture, got a pretty strong-looking women's tag team division there at the top with a couple other teams that are formidable and certainly ones that you can put together to be formidable. Yeah, and if you want to get excited, I mean... I know you personally, myself, I mean, I would be very excited about some sort of three-way tag team match with Banks and Naomi and Baszler and, and, and Rousey and, 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 you know, Bailey's crew as well. So I think if you want to make the tag team women's tag team division matter, there's no better way to do it. I mean, that's about as, as a, as good of a matchup as, as you're going to get, you know, honestly, even without (laughs) sky and Kai, just those four right there. Um, of Naomi and Sasha and Rousey and Baszler, or just, that just makes it great. And I think it gives Baszler a lot of meaning and it gives Rousey something to do. Well, let's face it. There's not a lot for her to do right now. Yeah. So we then have McIntyre and Moss take on the Usos. McIntyre and Madcap end up getting the win here. The Usos never seem to win unless it's a title match. Um, Pretty good long tag match here. Um, you know, I don't. The pairing of McIntyre and Madcap's a little crazy because you know, back at uh, Saudi Arabia, 
McIntyre almost killed Mad Cat Moss with that Alabama slam. Now Moss and Babyface, they're tagging together. But I do think that Moss has looked better recently in the ring. You know, he's he's got the speed. He's looked strong. At the house show the other night, he was in the main event tagging with the Prophets against Sheamus and the Usos. And they did a lot of nice spots in this match. It was worked really well. Then we got a ricochet interview where Corbin ended up attacking him. I thought this was maybe the best ricochets ever sounded in an interview because it didn't feel like he was totally scripted. How do you feel about ricochet in his interview here? Yeah, he was dressed like he's like Drake or something. You know, he was dressed yeah. in the, the chains and the, you know, and the fancy shoes and everything. He looked great and he was you know, definitely seeming very confident. Then Corbin comes over. I kind of like the pairing of these two men. I, I know we, we saw the matchup um, to open SmackDown a few weeks ago. I, I, I like it. I, I think it's great. I, I think it gives them both something to do, you know, two very good performers working together um, in, in matches that, you know, you, you have a little, you know, again, the same Baron or happy Corbin heat that you get, you know, whenever he's involved in a program with anyone, you, you just hate him naturally. And what he's doing to Ricochet is kind of like what he did to McAfee, kind of like what, you know, they were doing to McIntyre, um, you know, back when. So, so this is, this is good to me. Yeah. I, I like, I liked uh, everything about that opening match a couple of weeks ago, nice and long, you know, they, Featured Ricochet the way he should be featured. Triple H is a big Ricochet fan. Uh, you know, he finished it with the Shooting Star Press. A lot of people were like, oh, the Shooting Star Press is finally back. They're allowing him to do that. He was using the Shooting Star Press for the past six months. Yeah. And, and the whole reason why he's been using that is because the 450 splash, he doesn't like to use too often because it it hurts his back or something like that. And, um, you know, I saw him uh, take on Gunther at the house show. And obviously Gunther won the match, but it was it was a great match between the two of them. And then speaking of Gunther, we had the main event, Shinsuke Nakamura versus Gunther for the IC title. Nakamura gave Gunther, um, you know, a run for his money there. He really did work on Gunther's arm. I like the psychology of this match with Nakamura really beating the hell out of Gunther's arm every chance he could. The spot where Gunther came off the top rope and Nakamura caught him in the triangle um, arm bar was real impressive. And the whole idea was Nakamura was trying to take away Gunther's ability to hit his finisher, the big power bomb. But eventually Gunther was able to hit it after he hit that shotgun drop kick to the back and even that move was like just showing how Gunther was like, you know what? I've had enough. I'm just going to drop kick this jerk in the back and end this. Now he's taking me to the limit and I'm going to win this match this way. I don't care. And that's what happened. And, you know, I, again, the psychology of working on his arm, you know, you saw a couple of times Gunther went for the power bomb and couldn't get it but got it at the end and finished it. And that's one, another theme I've noticed in the matches since Triple H has taken over. They're all ending with the finish, somebody's finisher. So, you know, people are working towards their finisher, and that's how matches should end. They should end with guys trying to get their finisher hit because that's the move that finishes their opponents. And that's what happened here. I thought it was a good matchup. I'd love to see them... the the two of them wrestle again. Obviously we don't want to see match or rematches over and over again, but down the line sometime Nakamura and Gunther certainly match that I wouldn't mind seeing. And I thought that this match really sort of helped re-solidify Nakamura as a formidable um, competitor in the ring. We didn't need to see him win the IC title again, but we did need to see him, have a strong showing and he did just that. Yeah. 
And, um, you know, it also re-solidified the Intercontinental Championship, with which, you know, Triple H is clearly trying to make more important and try to bring up and elevate. So that's kind of cool. Um, we also, you know, I hate to, to bring up NXT, but the psychology of that match was was, was so good with the, the Gunther's hand. And it, it was kind of like taking a giant and, and knocking him down to size because you had, you know, his arm or, or whatever, his hand, whatever it was. Um, injured and that kind of even the score, you know, with Nakamura and, and Gunther and made it a little bit more, you know, uh, of a 50 50 toss up type of match. Um, we saw the same thing last night with Mandy Rose working on Zoe Stark to the point that her knee didn't even work at the, the NXT pay per view. So um, I love that kind of psychology in a match where, where just, you know, it, it kind of evens the score out by working on a particular injury or something like that. And I thought they did a great job with that. And that was really made this match all the more interesting and made you feel like, wow, Nakamura is really you know, getting himself in a position here to win and then Gunther just powered through it. So it was great, man. Yeah. Nakamura had that one hope spot where it was like, okay, he's, he's about to hit the Kinshasa goes for it and just gets turned inside out and backwards, upside down every which way by a clothesline really showed Gunther's power. And, you know, they did show a nice video package for the IC title, just as they have been doing for the U.S. title. And I don't think there's anything wrong with, you know, if you're going to elevate these mid-card titles and make them important, then make the title holder important. Let the title holder hold it for um, six months, eight months, nine months. Is I'll, I'll tell you this about um, the U.S. title now. We have uh, WrestleMania 39 coming up, right? And on the promotional poster, we have Roman Reigns, we have Becky Lynch, Bianca Belair, Ronda Rousey, Bobby Lashley. Wow. Now, you would think maybe somebody else like... Uh, Seth Rollins, Riddle. Rollins, Riddle. Um, Theory. Yeah, a lot of other people. Mac McIntyre, somebody like that. But no, they put Lashley on there. Now, maybe it's because they wanted to have another African-American. I don't know. But no, I, to me, it's because they wanted to have their U.S. champion on there. And he's more recognizable at this point, um, you know, just ca through the casual fans than Gunther is. So put Lashley in there and lastly he's been doing a hell of a job as a baby face holding that title so he's been unbelievable man he, he's really been unbelievable and I will say this just to, not to uh, rehash Gunther but man those drop kicks that he does are just amazing like those those high drop kicks I, I you know for a guy that big to hitting drop kicks that devastating Gunther's got a lot of good stuff going on man I don't love his entrance I actually liked I gotta say this I liked Gunther's old entrance when he first came up but even before he had the title I don't know if you remember this Matt the background would be all white like bright 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 white and he would come out almost as like a silhouette Gunther and he'd be standing there and then it would go red and then he'd walk to the ring. I don't like this new entrance and I don't like his new theme song at all. I think Def Rebel's done a bad job on, on a lot of their theme songs. Some have been good, but I, I'm not, you know, I don't like his new theme song Gunther, but I, I, I think that presentation can be tweaked a little bit, but just something I wanted to bring up. Yeah. I don't like a lot of the theme songs either. Like, you know, we were talking about Baszler. I don't like her theme. I don't like Champa's new theme. You know, there's so many theme songs. The, the theme song is part of the wrestler. It's part of their personality, part of their presentation. It's part of who they are. And, you know, it's important. And I just, I don't like what Gunther's theme song, you know, I, I just heard it the other night live in person. I just was like, they it's couldn't, come up, with some, they couldn't come up with something it's better. It's not memorable. Yeah, they too many of them are, and even Nakamura, like as nice as is as fun as Nakamura's is, they don't do the beginning part where it's like down 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 down. You know what I mean? Yes. It just goes right to the guitar riff, but um, 
And, you know, not having Boogs there is certainly. Well, insane. yeah. I mean, come on. We need Boogs there. I mean, <laughs> it's a bad. Yeah. Geez, I cannot wait for him to come back. We have we have a lot of returns that are coming, man. And it's going to be a fun next, you know, four to nine months with these returns because we have a lot to look forward to. A lot. Yeah. Hopefully, Triple H thinks as highly as Boogs as we do. But um, that about wraps up SmackDown. We'll move on to Raw after this break. The Beyond the Mat Podcast. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Beyond the Mat Podcast. All right, so Monday Night Raw kicked off with uh seemed like a new intro. Did you notice that? We had a new uh intro song and a lot of pyro to start that off i didn't think that was something that we had seen before Notice yeah that, that was that was cool man um the intro had what did it have just a lot i'm just recalling it had like all like the superstars like the big time p the seth rollinses and the becky winches right and the it just kind of had like a little sort of um little footage of each of them sort of thing. Yeah. Just some footage of a lot of the current people and, you know, some kind of song and it was greatness and it feels like greatness. That's all. Yeah. And great. Then, and then great. it went to a, a pretty elaborate pyro display in front of the Tron. But, um, so that was different, but then we had judgment day, open this up with the promo Rhea Ripley standing in the middle of judgment day everybody thinks that because she's standing in the middle of the two men that she's the leader i think it's just that's the right optics to have if you're gonna have two men and a woman to have the woman in the middle it would look weird to have her off to the side of two men but um you know she's getting better on the mic um Balor continues to sort of to me crack me up when he's on the mic you know, you're a bad father <laughs> and, and stuff like that. And, uh, I am danger or whatever the hell he was saying before. But, um, you know, priest gets on there, talks about his match next week with edge says he's going to end his career, but not just end it, put him in a wheelchair, make him have to be fed through a tube. So, you know, pretty intense there. And then he says Rey Mysterio's not in the house. Rey Mysterio ends up crashing their party, gets the better of him for a while. Balor comes in with a chair, and Rey drop kicks it. He gets the chair, hits Balor and Priest with it, but then Rhea Ripley gets in the way. I mean, at the end of the day, man, just hit her. You know, just hit her. If she's going to be beating up Dominic Mysterio, just hit her. I know, I know that we can't have man-on-woman crime, but... I mean, geez, how many times are they going to play up this Rhea Ripley standing in the way of a man for Judgment Day to get the better of him? Because eventually they do. Balor hits a coup de grace on the chair on top of Rey Mysterio. Looks like he slipped and fell when he did it. But um, this was basically to get us looking ahead to the match in Toronto next week between Edge and Damian Priest. Damian Priest still has uses that, you know, kind of comical, deep, I'm trying to be a tough guy voice. To me, it just sounds kind of funny. But, um, you know, some people think that he sounds good. I think he, he sounds like he's trying a little bit too much there. But whatever. They start this one off with the promo, get us ready for the match next week. Um, you got anything to say about this one? No, I don't mind Damien's voice that much. You know, I think I think it's, you know, it's, it's certainly deep, but that's the way he always sounded. You know, I don't think he's trying to do anything that different. But, yeah, man, I mean, it, you know, with Rey Mysterio attacking them from behind, it, it was nothing different. You know, it was nothing new. So I wasn't like, you know, 
nuts over it. I, I thought it was cool. I just thought out of a first segment opening up a show in Washington, D.C., I thought we were going to get something a little bit more out of that segment. And, and it was kind of the same stuff we already saw. You know what I mean? Yeah, it was definitely sort of the same thing, different day. Um, you know, how many times are we going to have Mysterio attack them or them attack Mysterio and them get the better of him? Dominic wasn't there. I guess he was still licking his wounds after getting beat up by Rhea Ripley. I do think they are setting up Dominic for a turn on Ray finally, but we'll see where that goes. But I am looking forward to Edge wrestling on Raw for the first time in a very long time. You know, he mentions it's the first time he's wrestling Raw in Toronto in 12 years, but it's the first time he's wrestled on Raw, period, in a very long time. And I think that this is eventually leading to Edge and Balor, which I think will be a great match. Maybe we'll get that at Clash of the Castle. But as far as... Go ahead. And when, when was the last time Edge wrestled on TV, period? I mean, I remember the match at Madison Square Garden against Seth Rollins um, about, you know, maybe it was, I don't know, man, if it was October of, of 21. I, I don't remember another Edge match on TV, period, since then. Yeah, the, the, his last match on television was in the pandemic era in the Thunderdome. Um I don't believe he had one on Raw. No, he had one on SmackDown um, because it was against Rollins. Remember Rollins stomped him and and almost ended his career again? Um, Unless I'm, that was a segment. It really doesn't matter. It's just an interesting fact that you brought up that I didn't even, you know, kind of put, put it together until you mentioned it. I think that was a segment because that that led to their match at the paper their hell in a cell match that they had right but um moving on from that the first match of the evening was a, another tag for the final first or not the final first round but the final first round match on the raw side alexa bliss and oscar versus nikki and dewdrop we had nikki ditch the cape and ha- turn it in for a leather jacket do drop as we mentioned earlier is looking for a name change i think pretty soon we're going to see that which will be great i think the do drop name is stupid and it just you know it defines her down i think she's a, a good wrestler and a good hand on the roster and i think the name just it hurts her and I, the way that they've been booking her in the matches honestly hurts her because I think that she did a good job in her program with Becky Lynch, um, I guess, earlier this year. That was at the Rumble when they had that match. But anyway, Bliss and Asuka end up going over this one. Asuka, this was probably the best of all th- of the three women's tag matches we've seen and in, in for this tournament this was probably the best of all three and that's not really saying much but Asuka gets the Asuka lock, Asuka lock on Dewdrop to finish this one off Dewdrop had a really nice looking Mishinoku driver in this match which Mishinoku driver seemed to be a theme of the night it seemed like in every single match somebody hit a Mishinoku driver at some point um, but you know, Nikki tried to break that up. Alexa cut her off and Oscar got the win. So Oscar and Alexa will move on and face EO and Dakota in the next round of the tournament next week. So again, that matchup's not going to be for the finals, but I don't think it needs to be. I I think that Alexa and Asuka don't need to be champion. Now, they have Bianca Belair ringside with them basically to do nothing. I mean, we heard nothing from her. She just twirled her braid and everything. But um, you got anything to say about this match? Yeah, so I kind of wanted to see Bianca come out there and, like, establish herself as the leader of this, this little trio and that didn't happen. You know, I wanted to see Asuka, even if, if I'm sorry, if, even if Bianca got on the mic for a little promo and it said, oh, I want, 
you know, I want you guys to show them who's boss or I want you guys to show, them, you know, just something, man. I, I just would have liked to have seen that knowing that we have this six man tag coming up, you know, and we didn't get that, which is kind of weird from a champion, AKA leader. You would think they would put her in that sort of position, you know? Yeah. And then as they, after they won, they, they exit and Bailey and her group were waiting at the top. The officials come out to, uh, get in the middle of it before anything, you know, before they mix it up and, you know, they faced off a little bit there. So they'll be facing each other next week. Will Dakota Kai, Io Sky versus Alexa Bliss and Asuka. I would imagine that somehow Dakota Kai's team will win that one and they will move on to the finals. I don't see Alexa, Alexa Bliss and Asuka as a permanent tag team, although they, they certainly could be. And, um, you know, a lot of people were saying last week, oh, Alexa didn't have the doll. Well, she had it this week. And maybe they're trying, maybe they're like, hey, look, we got a couple more of those in inventory. We got we to gotta keep uh, advertising it to get, get uh, some more sales there. But, um, you know... I'm I'm more interested to see now that Nikki and Dewdrop lost this match. Uh, can we get a repackaging of both of them? Can we get a different Nikki Nikki Ash Nikki Cross, more of her NXT character? And then I'm interested to see where they go with Dewdrop's name change and you know repackaging of her. But you know, better tag match than the the other ones that we've seen so far. And probably going to be better than the one we'll see on SmackDown this week. And then I think next week we'll probably get a real nice one with this team and EO Sky and Dakota Kai. Um, but that's pretty much all I got to say about that. We had Mustafa Ali and Cedric Alexander take on Miz and Champa. You know, at first I thought the Miz and Champa combination was a little bit weird, but Champa seems to be playing into it very well you know Miz actually worked very well in this match he was by far the least impressive wrestler in this match but he actually ended up getting bloody so you know we're seeing a, a more um you know a tougher Miz here under Triple H not seeing him just doing the Miz TV segments and, and not mixing it up with anything. Really cool spot where Mustafa Ali went for the 450 splash and Champa drop kicked him in midair and then hit the fairy tale ending on him to finish him off. And I also think Ali and Cedric Alexander is a pretty cool tag combination as well. So you see some emphasis here on the men's tag division getting different tag teams established here. Although we have tag teams like the Los Lotharios. And while I'm on that topic, I forgot to mention on SmackDown, we saw Francois and Marseille. Yes. Get, um, with Max Dupree yes. and Maxine Dupree. And Los Lotharios came in said that they wanted to, you know, join the maximum male models, Dupree, Max, that is, tells them he's not, they're not, uh, you know, maximum male model material. And the Lotharios tell them, we're not talking to you, we're talking to her. And then she looks at them. So maybe we'll get a feud between Mansois, Marseille, and Los Lotharios which would be nice because that's, you know, two more sets of tag teams doing something. So, yeah, man, that's going to be a very fun uh, little feud between um, Max Dupree and uh, I'm sorry, the, the Maximum Male Models and uh, Los Lotharios, um, almost like who could who could be the most beautiful, uh, you know, type of thing. It's it's also. You know, another thing on SmackDown that we didn't mention was the Sami Zayn stuff, which was pretty damn interesting, to be honest with you, how he took the Claymore from from Drew. I mean, we can get to that another time because I am I know that's going to progress, but um, very interesting stuff with, with that, too, that we did kind of gloss over a little bit. 
Yeah, he's, uh, you know, he's been trying to do the bidding for the, the Usos, and then he comes in, he... Drew is about to hit the Claymore on the Usos, and he gets in the way, and he takes it instead. Eventually, this is going to come to a head, and I think Kevin Owens is going to say, hey, listen, these guys aren't your friends, just like that, you know, when he did it a couple months ago or whatever, and that's going to be what joins Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn together and gets Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn to take on the Usos and hopefully take those tag titles from them. But I thought this was a nice little tag match and a good establishment of who, you know, obviously we see Miz and Champa together, but Miz and Champa worked well together here and, you know, it, it more firmly established them as a tag team or a possible tag team and another possible tag team with Ali and Cedric Alexander. You know, we've seen Cedric Alexander and Shelton Benjamin enough. It was nice to see Ali work with Cedric Alexander. They did a good job here. Um, and like I said, the finish was real nice with the Ali going for the 450, Champa hitting him with the drop kick out of midair, and then taking that right into the fairy tale ending. I always think the fairy tale ending is a really cool looking finish. And a lot of a lot of Champa's stuff is is good. I I his style isn't really my style as far as like always doing just the big running knees and the and the you know arm breakers and things like that. But his finishing moves are pretty cool looking. And, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's something to be said for that. I mean, I also thought that. You know, the Miz at the beginning in that promo before the match was kind of like deferring to Champa a little bit, you know, like almost it wasn't like Champa was his sidekick. It was kind of like they were both either equals or, you know, the Miz kind of presented him with that card um, that he wore around his neck and Champa was very appreciative of that. And then you had, you know, Miz saying, we're awesome. And I do think that they are maybe be going to become a tag team here. I mean, is that the, the direction you, you see it going for a little bit? Yeah. And until they eventually champ, it turns on him because, you know, you, you notice in a lot of their interviews, Miz cuts champ off and starts talking. Now he didn't do it in this one. So that kind of was a swerve from what we had been seeing. Like the, the interviewer would ask Champa something and then Miz would start answering for him, you know? And right. in, in this situation, Champa sort of had um, the floor when he needed it. So I, I do like how, um, you know, Champa's playing ball with this and it's working. Um, so, yeah. and, it, and it's making the Miz more of a, more of a character I can take seriously as a wrestler. So all the way around, I think it works. Do you think the Miz is going to be the one who gets turned on? Or do you think the Miz is going to be probably the Miz is going to turn on him, right? He's getting too much spotlight type of thing. I deserve the spotlight, right? Yeah. Cause first Miz was, uh, you know, taking the spotlight from him in the interviews, like I was saying. And then now Champ is starting to get it. People are starting to pay attention to Champ. I think Miz is going to get jealous. And then he's going to say, you know, the hell with you. And, you know, do what he did to Logan Paul at the end of WrestleMania and skull crushing finale him or whatever at the end of a match, maybe. Right. All right. But, um, after this, we can get McIntyre and Owens with their really nice promos here, real impassioned. You know, Owens coming out talking about how he's, you know, we're getting the prize fighter Owens again. You know, much more serious. He even said that you know he's he's been not taking things seriously for a while and things like that. McIntyre, he made fun of McIntyre for always trying to talk in this deep, serious, mean voice or whatever. And eventually, you know, McIntyre's talking about how he 
had been the chosen one, got fired, worked his ass off or his arse off, and you know came back. He beat Lesnar. He beat Goldberg. He beat whoever else he beat. You know what he really should have said to Kevin Owens is, "I beat Goldberg, and you lost your Universal title, your WWE title to Goldberg." Oh yeah, no doubt. That would have been a nice line. But anyway, they worked a, a really nice match, and um, it ended in the DQ with the Usos. I felt like this was the way. So this match was placed in the middle of the card with the DQ for the Usos. So this was a main event quality match, but you don't want to end the main event with the DQ, I don't think. And and I think that having it end with the Usos interfering is probably the right thing to do because. It keeps Owens from losing. You don't want to beat him right now when you're trying to rebuild him as a serious competitor. And you obviously don't want to beat McIntyre heading into this big match with Roman Reigns. But they they literally unloaded their entire catalog of moves on each other. I mean, McIntyre hit an air raid crash off the second rope. Um... You know, got the Future Shock DDT in. Did all kinds of stuff in this one. Really nice Mishinoku driver. Kevin Owens had him in the tree of woe wo at one point. Hit the cannonball. Did a frog splash. Followed it up with a swanton. This was really nice. And then we had the yeah. inter interference, which, you know, McIntyre tried to get the Usos out of the ring. Looked like he botched clotheslining one of them out of the ring. And then threw the other one out and landed on top of the other. That looked a little bit dangerous, but it looked like they were fine because they got back in the ring, ran the ropes. He hit the Claymore on one of the Usos. And this was after Kevin Owens hit the stunner on him. And Owens told the Usos, told the tribal chief, he owes me one. But um, I thought this was a really good match. I thought the finish was right. And, you know... Both of them looked real strong, and that's sort of, you know, that's what I want to see both of them be doing. Yeah, it was great, man. And, uh, you know, in a certain way, look, it's an episode of Raw, but to have a, you know, 18 or 20 minute match that's that good, and then like just the Usos attacking and it's just the disqualification, like, I don't love that so much, you know, but. The, the good thing was that it did tie in, you know, and we, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but we, it did tie in with um, the Usos with Scarlet attacking Drew and then Drew backstage attacking the Usos with Sami Zayn there running away. Jey Uso calls him, where'd you go, track star? And then Sami Zayn, who is Kevin Owens' best friend, you know, it, it all just tied together in, in a certain way. So it does make sense in, in that way. It's just tough to see a match that good end in a disqualification, you know? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I don't like DQ finishes. I just qualify this one and give it a pass just for the fact that, you know, they're trying to reestablish Owens as a serious character and you can't you can't beat McIntyre here ahead of this match with Roman Reigns so you have them both look incredibly strong and then you have the Usos run in and ruin the whole thing so it, it makes sense why they I understand why they did it although I don't like DQ finishes yep but um, we also saw um, a little bit, a little video of um, Ezekiel in the hospital with his whole family. Basically, Ernie was there. His dad, Ernie. His dad, Ernie Jr. <laughs> it was. It was just all. <laughs> it was all Ezekiel <laughs> dressed up as different people. It was funny, man. That's the family I, and picture. you love to see that because everything's been so damn serious you know, with triple H and it's fun to see like a little sense of humor. Like everyone is him. Even like the kid with the baseball hat was, was him uh, yeah. crowding around the hospital bed. Yeah. That was, that was a pretty funny, um, picture there. And, um, 
I enjoyed that. And I'm I'm interested to see I don't I think we've seen the end of the Ezekiel character. I think we're gonna see Elias come back. Yeah, I agree with you. I do too. That 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 is clearly what's um gonna come out of this, that Elias is seeking his revenge, you know? You think Elias is gonna come back and then Kevin Owens is gonna say, You're not Elias, you're Ezekiel. <laughs> I think I think he's going to say I'm here to seek my revenge for what you did for my brother. You ended his career. And I think yeah. it's going to be funny. Yeah, I mean that's not bad. But or you bring back or you bring back which could be happening, man, based on that they're still going with this everyone has an E and the whole family and everyone's looks like like you could be going with honestly Elrod or or something like that who Kevin Owens said is their other brother um in a joking way but you could see like a totally new version of that of not elias not ezekiel but like another one come back which would be kind of funny too yeah they could do anything with it i i I just think that the whole thing was pretty hilarious um yeah man and the crudely kind of done picture like purposefully crude you know with with everyone around the hospital bed was really funny man again like that was great yeah. So moving on, we had the Riddle interview. He's getting set up and, uh, you know, they're fitting him with the microphone. Looks like he's somewhere. And Rollins comes out, says Riddle's down in his uh, mother's basement to get, <laughs> announce the end of his career or his retirement or whatever. And kind of funny too, man. Yeah. As if he's gonna come out and just announce that he's retiring. Right. Like, what a funny concept from Seth Rollins to even imagine that that's gonna be what he's gonna say, and he's telling everyone over and over that that's what that's what's about to happen. I thought this was kind of funny, man. Yeah, and then so Riddle gets gets on there and says, "Hey, listen, I'm actually not in my mother's basement." I'm here and they pan out and they show that he's backstage. He runs in, starts beating down Seth Rollins. They get into a a little melee. They fight over the announce table, which was another thing that we saw a lot of tonight. We saw a lot of people getting thrown over that announce table. Um, Eventually, Riddle hits a nice knee right onto Rollins, and Rollins flies over the barricade like upright. It was such a nice bump he took over that barricade after taking that knee from Riddle. And, um, you know, that was all to, you know, portray Riddle as more of a serious guy. They're definitely, you know, laying off of the... um, you know, they, they've they've added some IQ points to Riddle, I think, here. Yeah. And, um, you know, making their match here, going into Clash at the Castle, you know, getting some heat for it. Now, to me, there's I un, these are two of the top guys, and earlier in the summer, this feud seemed way more important when you factored in the money in the bank and all that and stuff like that. But for some reason, it, it, it just feels like this is a feud that just exists to exist. It doesn't seem like it, there's really any point in it. You know what yeah, I mean? man. Um, yeah. I, I, I think what's missing is the stakes of either a title or a money in the bank win. Like you said, like I, yeah, man, I, I agree. It's just, you know, Seth's kind of being the jerk for no reason and Riddle's pissed off about it and he's kind of getting, showing an angrier side. But you don't have anything tangible that that seems like a next step beyond these two don't like each other. You know what I mean? And I'm excited. They're two of the best, you know? Like, it's it's great, but I just wish there was some sort of championship or stakes involved, you know? Yeah, and and they push it off a SummerSlam to to give some build to it. But at the end of the day, to me, it was like, get it over with at SummerSlam because there's really no stakes to add to it. You're not making it a number one contenders feud. It's just a feud between two top performers, you know, top baby face, top heel. Now what it does 
is it gives a vehicle for Riddle to establish himself as a more serious character. So I think that's what they're accomplishing here, if anything. So I'm okay with that, I guess. But at the end of the day, it just feels like there's something not there. Yeah. Um, listen, it's hard to argue that point. You know, it, it's it's a, it's a it's a tough point to argue. But um, yeah, I wish it it had a little bit more significance. But at the end of the day, maybe it will lead to something more. You know, maybe this leads to some sort of. Uh, you know, Randy comeback where Seth is in their crosshairs or something. I, I don't know. I, 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 don't, I really don't know. By the way, when do you think, I mean, do you think Randy's on any sort of course for a comeback anytime soon? Well, I don't think he's coming back anytime soon at all. Mm. I think he needed back. So I don't think he'll be back this year. Interesting. I think like Royal Rumble. Yeah. Um, the problem with the Royal Rumble return is that you're going to have a, probably a Cody return at Royal Rumble. You're going to have, I mean, how many damn returns are we going to have at Royal Rumble this year? I mean, are we going to have a, a Boogs return, a Big E return, a Cody return, a Randy return? I mean, it, it seems like a lot, man. Yeah, I think Big E's still a ways off. But I think Cody, I think Orton, you could have The Rock. I mean... Becky Lynch. Becky Lynch. I think Lynch will be back by Survivor Series, though. But, um, but yeah, I mean, who knows? But it, that, it's just, I think it's nice to see Riddle have some seriousness and, um, but still, you know, be that, be a likable character as he is. You know, he's more of what he was in the indie scene. With the, um, you know, he's still a UFC fighter that can kick your ass, but he's still kind of, you know, a fun-loving guy. You know what I mean? Still the one thing that was great bro. about the end of um, that segment was like the visual of Riddle in the crowd with everyone looking in his direction in his immediate area and chanting, bro, bro, bro bro as they went out to fade to the next segment i i, I thought that was just really well done yeah I, I like that too um now next up we real quick we had a beer squash he came out and uh completely destroyed some guy whose last name was keller i guess next week he'll be facing somebody whose last name's Meltzer. yeah um, bo keller was making a bid for the main roster in that spot because he was, first of all, he didn't look like the typical squash opponent. He looked like he was ready to have fun. He was moving around. He actually got a really nice drop kick in. He looked kind of good, man. I have to be honest with you. Like out of all the squash opponents, like he kind of had the most electricity to him. And then obviously he fell victim, but it was, I thought, I thought this guy looked pretty damn good for a squash opponent. Yeah. So Veer ended up uh, hitting that big uh, body splash on him, and then the cervical clutch guy tapped out. That was that. A funny story here from the house show before we take our final break. Um, our truth comes out, gets everybody uh, excited, you know, tells one side of the arena to say what's up, gets this side to say what's up, other side to say what's up. Eventually he says, hey, when I was growing up, I used to watch John Cena, and I would watch John Cena defend the U.S. title all the t uh, all summer long. Now, the funny part about that is that our truth our truth's been in the WWE since 1999, before John Cena, before yeah, exactly. John Cena was ever there. You know, um, so he says, "I'm dedicating this match to John Cena, to whoever in the back wants to come out," and then Veer comes out. Beer kicks his ass. Now, our truth held his own for a little bit, but then en ends up tapping him out to the cervical clutch. And then Beer gets out of there. And then once our truth gets up, he gets on the mic and he says, Okay, I do not, I take that back. I do not 
dedicate that match to John Cena. <laughs> <laughs> And then, <laughs> oh, this guy is the funniest thing going, man. Oh, yeah, is he great? Funny guy, man. But um, <laughs> that's going to take us into the final hour of Raw, and we will talk about that when we come right back. The Beyond the Mad Podcast. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back to the Beyond the Mad Podcast. All right, so we're back here. Final hour of Raw kicked off with the U.S. title match between Lashley and Styles. Two baby faces, which is it's always hard for me to get invested in a two baby face matchup because, you know, they're two guys that I like, guys that I want to see win. Ultimately, I want to see Lashley retain this, to, you know, because I want the U.S. title to mean something. I want it. And it means more when the title holder is when he means more and he means more if he continues to win and when he's beating formidable opponents, that makes it mean more. So, and I think you can justify AJ Styles having this match, having, you know, collected some wins before this and they did a real nice video package before this match. So... Um, you know, they, they ended up working, you know, I think like 18, no, this was a long match. This was like a 22, 22 minutes, 22, 22 minute minutes. match. We had a run in here by the Miz and Champa. We also had Dexter Loomis, uh, basically jump the barricade and jump over the announce table. The whole, the announcers didn't acknowledge him. That took us into a commercial break, but. This was a really nice match. You know, Styles hit a really nice looking forearm going to ringside. Lashley hit a dominator. He had a really painful looking spine buster. Styles tried a rack bomb, which was a little bit sloppy. Um, just given Lashley's size. Uh I really liked the spot where AJ Styles got Lashley into the calf crusher and then calf cr- and then Lashley reverse that into the hurt lock from the same position. Um, uh, Lashley did his fireman's carry into the ring post that he likes to do. Um, really, really good match here between the two, these two. You know, Lashley's a powerhouse in there. AJ Styles has the ability to just hit move after move after move after move and doing it on a guy like Lashley is even more impressive. Lashley ends up winning after hitting the spear, which again, right way to finish it with his finisher. And he uh, retains his title here. What do you think of this match? Yeah, I liked it a lot. I mean, the only thing I would have liked to have seen was at the end what w- was, you know, maybe Lashley and Styles kind of shake hands. You know, I, I, I don't know why I needed that, but I did kind of want to see that. And we just didn't get that. Um, other than that, you know, look, it was good. It's just, again, it, it is hard, like you said, to get invested in two people that you like, you know, it's much easier to do bad on bad or heel on heel, you know, because, you know, in a certain way, everyone kind of has their favorite heel, but like with a match like that, like, yeah, I, I hear you, man, you want Lashley to win, but you, you, you sort of want to see styles win too. It's just a weird feeling you get from it, you know? Yeah, I feel the exact same way. Um, you know, it was funny at the house show, Bianca Belair and Asuka fought for the Raw women's title. And I was like, these two people were aligned on TV. Like, this makes no sense for them to be fighting. And they, and obviously Bianca won. And they ended that one with the handshake and Asuka raised Bianca's hand. And I thought that that was something maybe we'd see here from... Styles and Lashley. Now, the other thing about this match was that a lot of people thought, well, this should have been the main event match because it was for the U.S. title. What the hell? Well, the thing is, if you put this in the main event, let's say it goes on at 1040 Eastern time, then you know when the finish is coming. Because it was at 10 o'clock, and there was still an hour left of the show and two matches left. 
you don't know when the finish is coming. So it made it less, it made it less predictable when it was in that spot rather than the main event. So I was fine with it not being the main event match, even though it was probably the biggest match on the show. What did you think about the placement of this match? Yeah, and I did hear something about there was a big TV series finale on cable that night that they wanted to to maybe potentially place the match in the 10 o'clock hour. For, I'm sorry, in the at the end of the 9 o'clock hour for that reason. Um, that, you know, maybe it, it stole some thunder from that um particular series finale or or whatever it was incidentally raw did beat that series finale and was the number one show on cable and i think it got you know 2.1 or 2.2 million viewers or something like that but um better call saw yeah better call saw that's what it is but um it's you know listen man i have no problem with theory being the main event and I think that this was um, fine in the spot that it's in. And you have to remember, man, uh, they know that, you know, the third hour of Raw does the ratings do drop just because it, it's late on the East Coast. You know, people have worked the next day. And I think I think you could get rid of that third hour entirely and be just fine. Um, I hope that is something that they do, because to me, even even Seth Rollins said it recently. He said a three hour wrestling show is just obnoxious. I mean, two hours is like the perfect amount of time for a wrestling show. So I had no problem with this being in the middle of it. Screw it, man. It didn't need to be the main event. It's fine. Even Triple H has said he doesn't like the three hours. Um, but you know, money talks, and that's why they have the three hours. And it's been three hours for ten years. I don't think we're going to see it change. Even though I would agree with you, two hours is a lot more palatable. Um, but yeah, having this one in, at the, you know, crossing over into the top of the last hour or starting the last hour or whatever is actually a way to keep people engaged for that final hour. Now, after this match, we had Dakota Kai and Dana Brooke. Dana Brooke still carrying around that 24 seven belt for whatever reason. Um, not even mentioned really at all that she has it. And Dakota Kai wins this match pretty easily with her version of the Luba kick. It wasn't much to this match. I wasn't that entertained by it. I was more just waiting for the Ziggler and theory match, which I thought was good have anything to say about Dakota Kai and Dana Brooke that was basically a squash match to you know make Dakota Kai look good there I'm probably, yeah but yeah. why why did Dakota Kai not win the 24-7 championship did was that ever said or or, or I mean shouldn't she be the 24-7 champion well they didn't she won they didn't even acknowledge the championship at all I don't think that they're that's something that they're trying to emphasize very much at all it's yeah but just she a- did have the belt and, and even backstage she had it and she said i'm ready 24 7 remember that uh, dana said that to dakota kai yeah but um, i mean the commentary didn't i mean they made it a point to make that 24 7 belt not not uh, important as far as this match goes Right. I hear you. But like, my point is like, you're ignoring rules. So like, if I could pin you on a dining room table or on the floor outside the arena, but I actually win a match inside the ring with you, I don't get that belt. You know what I mean? That's what I'm saying. It, Whatever. I get it. Logic goes out the window. It's fine. But like, it's that, that's what I'm saying. Like w- she should be the 24 seven champion now. Yeah. I think that they're, they're trying to get rid of that title yeah be honest so they didn't just get rid of it then yeah you know i mean they got to figure out a way to do that but i don't i don't know how but um anyway we get ziggler and theory in the main event this was set up by a earlier interview where theory you know had a couple of pretty weak insults for ziggler called him a non-title having washed up has been or whatever and um, they ended up fighting. 
Um, in the background, you could see a door opening with a glove. A lot of people thought that this was Bray Wyatt. It was definitely Dexter Loomis. You know, another backstage segment, we saw a, a trash can on fire, security guards putting the fire out. That was when Drew McIntyre was walking past it, right? Yeah. So yeah. Loomis is, you know, wrecking havoc backstage and running over the announce table. This was a pretty good match here. Um, at one point, Theory went to do his little roll through, his somersault through the uh, ropes into the drop kick, went right into a nice looking famouser by Dolph Ziggler. Eventually, Theory hits the ATL on Dolph Ziggler, finishes him, wins the match. And I think that the point of that having this in the main event is just to end the the feud or whatever the hell is going on between Ziggler and Theory that was started when we were still in the Vince McMahon era and this was Triple H's way of ending that. Decent match. Nice to see Theory back on TV. Thoughts and prayers to him and his family after he had a death in the family of his uncle. That's why we didn't see him for a little while. And I thought that, uh, you know, it was a well-worked match by the two of them. Some people will say that they don't need to see Dolph Ziggler. I think he's great in the ring. And I think that he's a great guy for somebody like Theory to be working with. Um, but what do you think of the main event? Yeah, man. Look, it was great to see Theory back. And honestly, like to me, this was a little bit of a way of, of like, saying to everyone like oh you, you thought you know theory was gone for a few weeks you thought that i wasn't high on him well well he he ends my show tonight you know he he's my headliner going off the air so i think that might have played a little bit of a part in it like you've heard a little bit you know of doubt like oh you know th you know triple h isn't that high on theory triple h from what i've heard um, and I'm, I'm just reading a bunch of different sources, but I I've heard he's very high in theory, very as high, if not higher than Vince McMahon was, you know, and let's not forget, you know, theory and triple H were together a lot in, in, um, um, uh, NXT and, and they, they, they did a lot together in NXT. Uh, Johnny Gargano was, was with, um, theory a lot in NXT. There was a lot of segments with them. So, you know, you have, um, I, I think a statement, if nothing else, like, Hey, this is still a guy that I'm very big on from, from triple H in the way that he booked the show. Yeah, I agree. You know, um, and, and it's great to see him back, man. And I, I, I don't know why so many people hate this guy. Uh, you know, may, maybe it's because of the character, and he's incredibly cocky and incredibly mean and rude as a character. And, and to me, quite funny as a character, but I just, I just love him, man. I, I'll tell you right now, over the last few months, he has creeped into like my top five favorite people to watch in all of WWE. I love watching him in the ring. I love the way he talks shit to everyone who he's, he's going against. I love how he interacts with the crowd and he, he talks back to them. I love what he does. I, I just love it, man. It might not be for everyone, but I love it. Yeah, I, I, I like Theory's um his progression as a heel character. Definitely very um doing a really good job. He's come a long way, even since WrestleMania. Done a hell of a job. What do you think of him as a wrestler? Like in the ring? Like do, do you do you think he's very good? Because I, I find him to be great to watch. I'm just curious what you think about him as a wrestler. I think he's good. I don't think he's like fantastic, but I think he's, he's good. And he's, he's got uh, since like the fall last fall till now, he's made decent strides. He's definitely improved a lot. I don't think he's, I don't think he's like top, top tier. Great. But I think he's good and solid. And, you know, he's well on his way. Yeah. The thing I, I think is great about him is his selling. You know, he when he gets rocked with a move, 
I don't see many guys being able to do what he does in terms of, he just looks like he got shellacked and he's, you know, seeing stars and he, he's just so good at it, man. It's, it's very, it's, it's great to watch to me. Yeah, I agree, man. All right. All right. You ready for trivia? Yeah, let's go. All right. Jinder Mahal is billed from India. What country is he actually from? The United States of America. One more try. Sri Lanka. Jinder Mahal is from Calgary, Canada. Holy shit, man. Bet you never would have guessed that one. Nope, did not know that, man. Unbelievable. Good trivia question. Jinder Mahal, wow. Yeah. Built from India. But anyway, that about wraps up the show. You got anything else to add? No, Matt. Congratulations on that top 100. and Let's make it a top 90 uh, by by, uh, October. Well... If we can get our listeners to continue to uh, listen, subscribe, uh, leave us some ratings, reviews, five stars, of course. Join us on Patreon, patreon.com slash beyond the M-A-T-T. Follow us on Twitter at beyond at WWE. That will get us well on our way. Just listening to the show gives us the best support we can get. And that's about all we got for tonight. Thank you so much for joining us all. Thanks, Brad, for joining me tonight. And we will catch you guys next time. And thank you, Rick Boogs, too. And thanks, Rick Boogs, for uh, giving us the wonderful intro. And we hope to see him back soon. Hope he's having a great recovery. We will catch you all later. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks for listening to me on the mat. Subscribe so you don't miss a show. show, show, show.